Hello everyone, welcome. We are in a virtual way. <laughs> My name is Ken Lima Coelho. Thank you very much for joining us at YMC Calgary's 118th report to the community. We are certainly making history tonight as this is the first time in generations of hosting this event that it's happening online. My name is Ken Lee McQuello, Vice President Community Engagement for YMC Calgary. I'll be your virtual MC this evening. And uh, thank you, welcome, thank you for coming. Uh, I would love to have just fed you a bunch of delicious food and had a bunch of fellowship together, but we're just not in that place right now as a community. That's okay, we'll get through. In the spirit of reconciliation, I would like to acknowledge the traditional territories and oral practices of the Blackfoot Confederacy, which includes the Siksika, the Bigani, the Ghana, the Amskapi Bigani. We also acknowledge the Sutina, the Stony Nakoda First Nations, the Métis Nation Region 3, and all the people who make their homes in Treaty 7 region of Southern Alberta. We are all treaty people. I hope you had a chance to check out our 2019 annual report, which was sent to you with the login information for this meeting a couple of days ago. It's full of facts and figures about the YMCA, along with some financial information about the organization. If you haven't seen it, don't worry. You can find a digital version of it on our YMCA Calgary website or right on your smartphone through the YMCA Calgary mobile app. Find that free on iTunes or, of course, at the App Store. Now on to the official business of the meeting this evening. I will ask everyone to please mute your devices so we can move through this section in sort of a smooth fashion. We will certainly have the opportunity for questions later, particularly in relation to our current YMCA Calgary circumstances. I know a lot of you are interested to see what's going on with the Y right now, and we will get to that. We will address those questions though after President and CEO Shannon Dorham's update a bit later in the program. Questions will be accepted through the Q&A function on your platform. You'll see a little icon that says Q&A. That's how we'll be doing questions, and I'll give you a few more details after that happens. Now I am going to turn the virtual podium over to our chair, the chair of the board of YMCM Calgary, uh, our board of directors, Trevor Gardner, who will help navigate us through the business portion of this meeting from his living room. Hi, Trevor. Hey, Ken and uh welcome everybody and thank you for joining us we were uh, we were actually really impressed at how many people chose to join us even though uh even though this format's a little bit different um but we weren't surprised because uh we know that the why means a lot to a lot of people out there but thank you sincerely for everybody who uh found the time to join us this evening um thanks everybody for your flexibility as well in accommodating this format um, it is a first time for us, even for an organization with as much history as ours. It's certainly going to be a different experience, but we know, uh, know a good one. Um, at today's AGM, in alignment with YMCA Calgary's bylaws, we'll be accomplishing the following things. We'll conduct this formal business portion of the meeting where we present the 2019 financials and also appoint our auditors. We'll approve the slate of new directors to join the organization, and we will amend our bylaws through a special resolution. As you know, having accepted the invitation and joined this meeting, all voting on this matter, on these matters rather, has already occurred through a proxy framework established by the YMCA Calgary Board of Directors. What that means is that all voting on the formal items of business to be addressed at this meeting has already occurred. That happened by members submitting proxies as previously outlined in our correspondence and as outlined on our website. Those members who completed a proxy have empowered Pat White, Vice Chair of the Board of the YMCA Calgary, or failing her, they've empowered me, Trevor Gardner, Board Chair of YMCA Calgary, to be your proxy and to vote as you had directed. Or if such direction was not made in respect of a particular matter, to vote in favor of the matter. We will wait until all formal motions are put before the meeting before outlining and putting forth the votes that have been received by proxy in respect of each of those motions. We've also arranged for members to move and second motions on each of the formal items of business to ensure that the meeting moves along smoothly. This will occur via the Q&A function and will be visible to each participant on the call, but there may be a slight delay in this showing up in the Q&A stream. We understand this is all a little bit different uh, and a different process than we've typically used to conduct our annual general meeting. While we wish, sincerely, we were still able to meet in person and conduct our meeting as we usually do, 
including uh, social fellowship afterwards, that isn't possible this year in light of the physical distancing, as you're all aware. As a result, we've had to make these necessary adjustments to help ensure the formal portion of the meeting runs as smoothly and efficiently as possible <clears throat> in light of the technology platform that we are using. This will hopefully enable us to wrap up the formal portion of the meeting in an efficient manner so that we can get on to what we are sure most of you are really here for, that being an update on what's happening with your YMCA and how we are adjusting to the current circumstances and also answering questions from our members. With that, it gives me great pleasure to call to order the 118th Annual General Meeting of the YMCA Calgary. The Board of Directors has previously resolved that quorum for this meeting shall be at least 15 members represented by proxy, and I've received confirmation that members in excess of that number have validly submitted proxies. In addition, I have received confirmation that notice of this meeting has been properly provided as required by the bylaws of the YMCA. As such, I declare the meeting is properly called and constituted for the transaction of business. Typically, this is an opportunity for me as board chair to look back and celebrate the successes of the YMCA Calgary in the past year or so, and there is much to celebrate. So I still want to take that opportunity to talk about what we've achieved. The organization saw remarkable success in meeting community needs, including successfully opening its fourth and final new facility since 2016. This is a remarkable accomplishment for our YMCA and speaking on behalf of all the board members, I'm extremely proud of the management team, the employees, the volunteers, and the members and donors that made it happen. The Brookfield Residential YMCA at Seton was up and running, the last opening in a period that saw our YMCA double in size in many aspects, or even triple in some, in a few short years. We are now in the impact business in ways we hadn't been before. Through the arts, with the official public launch of the YMCA, YMCA Arts Program just a few months ago. On the ice, with three new rinks and a leisure ice surface in a city hungry for them. And I can tell you, as a hockey dad myself, I am sure happy we have them. <clears throat> and even in a world of sports competition and large-scale sporting events, whether it be in the big pools and college-sized gyms or through tournaments of every variety. But then, COVID happened. Now you're going to hear from Shannon Dorham, our president and CEO, shortly on how the YMCA team is managing through this crisis and what plans are in place on a careful and well-managed eventual reopening. But it is upon the foundation of good governance practices, strong systems, and passionate teams that we will come back. The team is working a lot, and I would underscore a lot, and dreaming a little to ensure that this will not just be a memorable chapter in a proud history, <clears throat> excuse me, to ensure that this will just be a memorable chapter in a proud history that goes back generations and will go forward for many to come. Now on to the agenda for today's meeting. The agenda for the meeting was circulated in advance and posted on the YMCA Calgary's website. Four matters will be voted on. Those being, one, the approval of our financial statements for the year ended December 31st, 2019. Two, the appointment of our auditors for the upcoming year. Three, the appointment of four new directors to the board of directors of the YMCA Calgary for a three-year term. And four, an amendment to our bylaws. I will now deliver YMCA Calgary's Audit and Investment Committee report. The audited financial statements have been reviewed by the Audit and Investment Committee and approved by the Board of Directors. They were circulated via the YMCA website in advance of this meeting. Summarized financial information is also included in our annual report. As a member and on behalf of the Board of Directors, I move that the audited financial statements of the YMCA Calgary as at and for the year ended December 31st be approved. Can I have a seconder? I confirm that we have had a member second the motion through the Q&A function. Please note there may be a delay in that showing up on the screen. As noted previously, we will wait until all formal motions are put before the meeting before outlining the voting results. 
Our next obligation is the appointment of auditors. As a member and on behalf of the board of directors, I move that the firm Deloitte be reappointed as our auditors until the next annual meeting or until their successors are appointed. Do we have a seconder? I confirm that a member has seconded the motion through the Q&A function, but again, please note there may be a delay in such showing up on the screen. Again, as noted previously, we will wait until all formal motions are put before the meeting before outlining the voting results. I'll now pass things over to Pat White, Vice Chair of the Board and Chair of the People and Governance Committee. Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome. Welcome to our virtual AGM. Um, my first order of business is a bittersweet one. It's to acknowledge and profoundly thank Howie Shikazi. Howie is what we call a graduating director. He has served nine years with the board. He's been a board member, a committee chair, board chair, and has completed his term as past chair. And um, we are incredibly grateful for all that Howie has brought to the Y in Calgary. Those nine years have been busy. They've been full of change, growth and change for the Y, and a lot going on in the city as well. And Howie has brought wisdom, expertise, and just a real keen sense of community and how this city works and comes together. So Howie, we thank you deeply. We will miss you, but I hope you're not going too far away. Um, know that you will stay a strong ambassador, a strong champion, and a strong mentor to us. If this was a typical AGM, Howie, I'd invite you on down now, pat on the back, big hug, lots of presents. Um, so hold on, we'll do all of that when we're allowed to. And in the meantime, please just accept our heartfelt thanks and best wishes. Uh, a typical board term is seven years, and that's made up of three different terms, three years, two years, and two years. And so at the end of each of those terms, we confirm at the AGM our directors that are in fact renewing. So at this point, um, I would like to find that page in my agenda <laughs> and, um, and, and just express my gratitude um, and confirm the new members or the members that are in fact renewing their terms. You see them up on the screen. Anna Alderson, Minu Alawalia, Rod Hurd, Zane Velji, Lisa Worthington, and actually myself, I am also a renewing director. So thank you, we are so glad you are continuing on um, and so appreciate your hard work and commitment. And finally, I'd like to just also acknowledge um, the other members of the hardworking team that is the board of directors and, and similarly, my, my heartfelt thanks for your commitment and hard work. Sabrina Beauchamp, Roger Chafin, Adam Pekarski, Damon Tenzola, Peter Taylor, and Paul Wright. And of course, James Gray, a lifetime director, his commitment and loyalty to the Y. Thank you. Back to you, Trevor. Thank you, Pat. Now I'd like to take a moment to let you know about a change in board leadership. As I am graduating from the board chair role to sit as past chair, the current vice chair, Pat White, will step into the role of the board chair. The Board of Directors has also voted and named Zane Belgi as the new Board Vice Chair. Thank you to each and every one of our board members who will continue their exceptional service to YMCA Calgary. And I can say firsthand, uh, it's been an extremely busy and active year in the partnership with each and every one of you, and particularly with Pat as, uh, as the Vice Chair, and in many cases, my partner uh, on, on many difficult and, and interesting and challenging discussions has been absolutely terrific. And I have the utmost confidence that uh, the wise and terrific hands with her as chair and all these new board members. It gives me great pleasure to present to you the slate of four candidates to join the YMCA Calgary's board of directors. As a member, and on behalf of the Board of Directors, I move that the members of this annual general meeting approve the appointment of the following new directors to the YMCA Calgary Board of Directors 
for a three-year initial term. James Anderson, Tom Horvath, Kim Jones, and Linda McLean. Let me tell you about a little, let me tell you a little bit about each of them. James. James has significant investment management experience and depth, currently working with Palisade Capital Management. He's drawn to being more deeply involved with the Y now as part of his deep passion to see his hometown of Calgary flourish and to see the community prosper. He's enjoying, he wants to be part of having a community that works and plays together and supports each other. And James, I could say your investment management expertise is certainly something that we're looking forward to over the upcoming years. Tom Horvath. Tom comes to us with strong Indigenous and energy industry leadership and experience. He's currently serving as the Indigenous Relations Leader for Imperial Oil. Tom's passions are for youth and community, and he has deep roots and engagement in driving programs that enable Indigenous youth to flourish and grow, which is a very, very significant part of where the Y has been in Calgary and where we are looking to go in the future. Kim Jones. Kim is a senior leader in the not-for-profit world, serving as general counsel for Winsport. Kim brings to us extensive corporate, legal, and risk management experience and wisdom. She's passionate about serving her community and expanding the social impact of organizations like the YMCA. Welcome, Kim, and your experience navigating many of the same issues uh, that we experience at Winsport will be incredibly valuable. Linda McLean. Linda brings to us our board strong leadership and depth in the not-for-profit world, including in community development and health promotion. She's currently serving as executive director at the Brenda Strafford Center. Linda is passionate about building community and fostering well-being for children and families, and the breadth and depth of her not-for-profit experience is going to be a tremendous addition to our board. We are extremely lucky to have this caliber of directors join our ranks. Now, to the formality of the motion that I made before, may I have a seconder for this motion? I confirm that a member has seconded the motion through the Q&A function, but again, note there may be a delay in such showing up on the screen. Again, we'll wait until all formal motions are put before the meeting before outlining the voting results. The last obligation of business for the meeting is the approval of a special resolution for a bylaw update. This will occur via an amendment to the existing bylaws. This update is in alignment with the recommendation from Imagine Canada, through which YMCA Calgary has accredited status. The Board of Directors recommends that members at this annual general meeting approve a special resolution. This change will approve an amendment to the constitution and bylaws of the YMCA Calgary. <coughs> whereby section 40.C therein shall be amended to read, the president and chief executive officer will participate in meetings of the board and shall have no voting rights at such meetings. As a special resolution to be approved, this resolution must be passed by at least 75% of the votes cast. As a member and on behalf of the board of directors, I move to approve this update. May I have a seconder? I can confirm that a member has seconded the motion through the Q&A function. Again, please be patient as there may be a delay in this showing up on the screen. Now that motions for all formal items of business have been placed before the meeting, I would ask that Pat White report on the results of the voting via proxy. I'm pleased to confirm that all votes received via proxies from members in advance of the meeting are in the affirmative, in respect to all of the matters to be voted on. And by raising my hand, I hereby confirm that I vote all proxies in favor of each motion that has been placed before this meeting and confirm that such votes are to be recorded into the record of the meeting. Thank you, Pat. I hereby declare that all motions are unanimously carried and direct that an entry to that effect be included in the minutes of the meeting. Thank you and welcome to our new directors. And with that, uh, the business portion of the meeting has now been concluded. And as a member and on behalf of the board of directors, I move to close the formal business of the meeting. Do I have a seconder?
I confirm that a member is seconded the motion through the Q&A function. I think you know what I'm going to say next. There may be a delay. Um, all in favor? I confirm that Pat White has exercised her voting power by proxy to vote in favor of the termination of the formal business of the meeting. The motion is carried and the formal meeting is closed. Thank you, and I will shortly turn it back over to Ken to continue the program. Before I do, though, I just wanted to reiterate something that I said at the start, which was we have been through an exceptionally difficult and challenging time uh, at the at the Y, uh, as has our entire community. And what I can tell you is as a board member, um, we've been extremely heartened by all the hard work, uh, commitment and dedication that uh, the management team and the all and, and the employees of the Y have committed towards the organization. It has not been easy for anyone, um, but they've done a terrific job under some ex some, ex some excuse me some circumstances that none of us could have envisioned. Equally, uh, our volunteers and our donors have stood by us every step of the way. Um, you know, even up until today, we've started we've continued to receive significant donor interest and support of what we were trying to do at the Y and ensuring that we'll come back stronger than ever. Um, our partners are a key part of this as well, whether it be at the city or whether it be at many of the not for profit organizations are around the city that we work with and are a huge part of what we've done. And finally, I'd just like to say a big thank you to each and every one of my fellow board members. Um, it's been uh, an exceptionally busy year with a lot of highs and also a few lows. Um, but throughout it, we've had a terrific team uh, that that uh, that is committed a ton of their time on a volunteer basis, and I'm really excited about the new members and the skills that they're bringing to the board. And with that, Ken, and sorry to add something to your carefully curated script, uh, I'll turn it back to you. My, that's great. Thank you, Trevor, and thank you for your leadership in this amazing time. And um, to what uh, Trevor just said, we will have a pretty significant donor announcement later on in the program so stick around for that not only have we seen incredible interest but there's an opportunity for the people at this agm to to uh, jump on a pretty interesting bandwagon that we hope you'll consider all right now uh, we know this is an extraordinary time as trevor said but um we've got great leadership and we want to hear now from our president and ceo shannon dorham to give us an update on our charity and what's next in this time I noticed that there are some questions coming in already uh, from people on the AGM uh, Q&A, so please keep those coming. That is totally fine. We will get to questions, but I'm going to give you just a few notes now. Um, there are some technical limitations because of the virtual nature of this meeting, you've probably noticed, but you will have the ability to ask those questions once Shannon concludes her remarks through the Q&A function on your screen. Now, this technology doesn't allow for verbal questions from our guests, so the Q&A will be the function, um, the method that we use. Apologies for that. It's just a technical uh, piece that we had to navigate. Then as moderator, I will pose the questions to Shannon verbally for her response. Please note one other thing. Follow up questions live during this meeting are just not possible because of a built in time delay in the technology. But we are happy to take back those questions later if you need additional clarity on any question that is posed through that Q&A function. And again, once again, thanks for your flexibility as we tackle this meeting in a virtual environment. It is truly appreciated. Now I welcome Shannon Dorham to make her CEO presentation. Shannon. Great. Thank you so much, Ken, and good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you so much, first of all, for joining us. And although I can't see you, I know many of our great YMCA friends are with us tonight, and I really appreciate uh, you making that commitment to us at this time. And I know like us, uh, many of you have been navigating this new COVID world and it's likely had impacts on all of your lives. And the first thing I wanted to say is that I, I hope you're taking care and I hope that your families are, are healthy and doing well during this time. What I will say is that there's one thing that I've come to know and love about our YMCA is that we truly are a community that supports each other. And I've seen that even more in the last nine weeks, as Trevor's mentioned, and I feel very grateful uh, to be part of this community, that's for sure. So uh, many of you, uh, like, like Trevor, uh, know that I often like to start my presentations by saying thank you to the people that make everything that we do possible. And, and tonight's certainly no exception. 
And most of you will know that within hours of our shutdown, we were mobilizing very, very quickly. And I heard from friends and partners and colleagues who wanted to know how we were doing and if they could help. And I, I think this is truly the spirit of our YMCA and it, it came through uh, louder than ever. So with that in mind, um, I do want to echo a few thank yous that Trevor provided uh, and a couple of them are very special, as you know. Uh, the first couple go to Trevor and Howie, who have helped to lead our YMCA through its incredible evolution and who I feel very privileged to have worked with and certainly to have learned from. To Pat and Zane, who are taking the baton for the next leg of the race and will no doubt help us renew and thrive. And as Trevor mentioned to our donors, our members, our volunteers who are supporting and cheering us on, we really are here for you and we will be here with you as the community heals. To our board, uh, who has and continues to guide us with strength and compassion, thank you for your leadership. And I'd also like to say a special thank you to Ross Bentley and Jeff Backer, who have helped us so much in making this virtual AGM possible. And lastly, but certainly not least, I know many of my colleagues are on the line tonight. Um, some are working, some are at home, and they're doing their jobs by being at home. You really are the heartbeat of this organization, and thank you so much for doing your part and for working so hard uh, for us now and for when we make our, our recovery. So we certainly have a, a long history of service and responsiveness to community needs, and, and most of you know that we go back 118 years, as is evidenced by the title of this meeting. But I often like to show this slide as a representation of how our YMC has evolved over time and adapted to meet the community need. On the left is a picture of our very first official branch, which used to be firehouse number four. It was known as the Riverside uh, YMCA. So the city gifted that to the YMCA to run in 1926. We did hand that back in 1948, but as you'll see on the right hand side of the slide, we still have a very strong partnership with the city of Calgary. And this is the modern day center of community uh, that was the fire hall almost 100 years ago and certainly means just as much to the community. And the pandemic has shifted the way we're living our lives, but we are ready to respond. And the moment we get the go ahead, uh, we look forward to swinging those doors wide open. So while our buildings are closed, we certainly haven't stopped doing our work in the community. And I apologize to you that can't see the this slide here, but it is a really beautiful one. We'll try and get it out to you so you can see the visual. This is a story from our Quarry Park Child Development Center. Um, and, and following the slide, I do want to tell you a couple of other really great things that we're doing. So one of our staff members had reached out uh, from the Quarry Park Child Development Center and wanted to send some thoughts to the, children's, the children and families that they were missing. And after a little bit of conversation and tweaking, all of our early year staff were invited to participate in a project that would allow them to either submit a word or a photo of them holding a heart to express how they were feeling. So what you're seeing on the screen here are the results of these projects and these have been shared with all of our child care families and what I'm told is that uh, we got a whole bunch of likes and thumbs up very quickly from uh, the families that they went to. So really great example of our child care and early years team um, taking a leadership role and connecting with, with the people that we care about. We've also become pretty handy when it comes to building online programs for the community. So here are just a few screenshots of our talented teammates providing a combo of activities for kids and adults from arts to yoga. We've really got an incredible mix. And for anyone that hasn't had the chance to check out the Why at Home site, um, this is available on our website and we will continue to update these videos as we move ahead. So really great example of our staff being creative and uh, taking on some new activities. So this is one of my favorite quotes, and some of you have seen this on the board, uh, actually right behind me in my office here. Um, Although this is a challenging time, we're, we're choosing to see that there's opportunity in this crisis, and we're using this moment certainly to think about our experiences differently. And right now we're tackling projects and technologies faster than ever, and adapting programs to suit the new environment that we're in. And every day we are thinking about new ways of working, and most importantly, thinking about the future. And I think that's going to require us to be nimble, to be responsible, to be responsive and creative. But we're definitely up for the climb. And so my next few slides are actually intended to give you a glimpse into how we've navigated these last few weeks and uh, certainly to what we see ahead. 
So late on March 4th, uh, 15th, I received a call from the mayor and he said, I'm sorry to tell you this, but we are going to need to order you to close. And minutes later, the state of emergency was issued and instantly we started to demobilize the association. Uh, one of the things that I'm very proud of, however, is that we had a plan in place to do this that was about six hours old. Uh, we had pulled everyone together on a Sunday afternoon and, and built this plan. And so we were able to jump into action uh, right away. Shortly after that, it became quite clear that this closure was going to be significant and long term and that we were going to have to make some difficult decisions. And we unfortunately had to temporarily lay off almost 1400 of our colleagues. And I have to tell you, that was probably one of the most difficult uh, moments in, in my CEO career. Uh, but I, I'm here and working hard and I know the rest of us are so that, uh, that we can get back to business. We did retain what we call a recovery team of uh, at then at the time approximately 53 people who would then be responsible for taking care of the buildings, doing all the great work that I told you about uh, virtually and, and otherwise, and then creating our plans to reopen. And we've set a set of principles to guide us. And one of those uh, certainly at the top and, and most important to us was people first. So with that in mind, we agreed it was important to continue providing benefits coverage for our full-time staff while they're on temporary layoff, and that's a commitment that we continue to maintain today. And we've also uh, developed an employee assistance fund to support our colleagues that were financially impacted, and this would allow them to access things like financial support for groceries, essential bill payments, rent or medical bills. And I'm very proud to say that we have distributed more than $50,000 to our colleagues since early April uh, to make sure that they're, they're doing okay. And we've also been busy fundraising. Uh, many of you would have seen and participated in the Stay With Us appeal to support the YMCA. And I'm pleased to say that we had nearly 600 members decide to stay with us. And I know many of you are on the call tonight and I, I can't tell you how much we appreciate it and how much of a difference that's going to make as we continue to provide uh, virtual experiences and get ready to reopen. And lastly, as you've seen, uh, we've done a ton of work in the virtual space and uh, we plan for that to continue for the foreseeable future. So as we move ahead, we see the next six weeks as being critical planning windows. Uh, we have structured our teams to focus on four key areas, the four that you see on the slide there. And I'm happy to tell you that all of that work is underway. And as Trevor said, we have incredibly committed teammates that are, are doing this work and are very organized and are making sure that all the right precautions will be in place. So as you'd, you'd expect, our key priorities within those four streams continue to be around our focus to keep people safe and the necessary prerequisites that will need to be in place for us to reopen. And as much as we keep an eye on the timelines provided by the government, we will open only when we feel it is absolutely safe to do so. And we can offer the same level of experience that members expect from us. And I think that principle is incredibly important. And I know that my colleagues, especially those around uh, the leadership group that's with us now, uh, really agree with that. And lastly, uh, I'm excited to announce that after many months of hard work, we'll be launching a new technology platform. The COVID-19 situation has actually enabled us to accelerate some work here. And this system will enable members to manage their own accounts online. And I'm sure that it is going to make life easier for our staff. So all of you that were class users will, I think, be quite pleased with uh, what we're putting in place. We're uh, looking at this project, which we call Elevate, to really transform the digital experience of our members, and we can't wait to introduce you to it. And if all goes well, I know Tanya Connolly's out there holding her breath, uh, we will aim to launch the system July 1st. So you can look forward to, uh, to seeing and learning more about that as we get a little bit closer. Once we have um, the plans for the four streams in place and are ready to activate, we'll turn our thoughts to the long term. And some of the bullets on this slide are intended to show you how we're thinking about this, which really is to say that we are looking at this as a long term uh, situation that we're going to have to navigate. And in doing so, um, we are planning our recovery to be slow and deliberate um, and obviously focused foremost on the health and safety of everyone we serve, including our staff and volunteers. What we do know is that recovery is going to require us to change the way that we run programs, the way that we organize our weight floor, the way that we offer childcare, the way that we run summer programs, and that's just to name a few. And so that is part of that 
remobilization work that is underway. But the good news is that we've got a great running start and the benefit of being part of a federation, part of an international movement is that we've got the benefit of learning from people that have gone before us and they have been very generous in providing us all the best practices that are going to set us up for success. And to add just a splash of excitement to this, uh, we do plan to launch a new 10 year strategic direction in the fall, something that many of you will know we've been working hard on for the better part of a year. And the elements you'll see in this plan when we hopefully reveal it in the fall will include a number of priority areas that as we see in the community around us will be more important than ever. And uh, again, we can't wait to share that with you. So to wrap up, I thought I'd share a bit of inspiration. This is from a member and a donor who participated in the Stay With Us campaign. I think it nicely sums up who we are, why we exist and why the community needs us more than ever. Uh, we've been around for 118 years and we certainly plan to be around for a whole lot more. So as uh, our friend, the mayor likes to say until then, um, please make sure your hands are clean, your minds are clear and your hearts are open and we will be with you every step of the way. So with that, I will thank you uh, for entertaining my thoughts and I know there are probably many questions and I know Ken is committed to moderating that for us and I look forward to answering them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shannon. That's great. Um, so yes, it is the moment to pause for questions. As a reminder, questions will happen through the Q&A function on your screen. This technology does not, unfortunately, allow for verbal questions from our guests. So the Q&A will be moderated through the Q&A method that I mentioned, moderated by me. Um, I will take a look at the question, then I can pose it directly to Shannon for her response. Follow-up questions can't work because of there's a, a built-in time delay in the technology, but we're really happy to get back to you if you need additional clarity on any question that is posed through the Q&A. And if you're a YMCA staff member, remember we're doing regular updates uh, every day, um, an, an email, uh, sorry, a phone call update. Uh, we're doing uh, e email updates through our CEO, through Shannon, and we're also doing town halls. So there'll be lots of other opportunities to ask your questions, but feel free to ask them today as some people already have. So Shannon, the first question I am going to pose from one of our staff, I think, uh, or at least somebody who's connected to our childcare, is do you have an estimated date for the reopening of our child care? Now, child care was spelled out by the government in phase one of the province's reopening plan. What can you tell us on our status right now on child care? Yeah, and thank you for the question. It's a great one. Uh, one of the things that we continue to receive daily are updates from the provincial government on the guidelines that are required to safely reopen, reopen certain elements of our business. And so we just received those guidelines not that long ago from the province of Alberta, so we know what's required of us to do that. We are working on plans right now, and I can tell you Carol is, is working as hard as ever to make sure that we can do that safely. So we're still in that planning mode. We haven't picked a specific date, but we do know that childcare is likely to be in the early phases of what we do reopen. So unfortunately, I, I can't give a specific date, but as Ken mentioned, we will continue to provide updates through email and other means as soon as we have that information available. Okay, thank you, Shannon. Another question comes, uh, really, it's it's sort of the big question, and you nodded to it a little bit, but maybe you can give us a bit more commentary. Does the YMCA have any idea when we'll be reopening our doors? Obviously, the health, fitness, and aquatics facilities that we run, the big rec centers, the centers of community, are probably at the heart of this question. In the government's eyes, that's in phase three, but what can you tell us on when, when that might be and how we're preparing for it? Yeah, Ken, that's exactly right. And we did participate in a webinar today with the Calgary Emergency Management Agency. So that's SEMA, that is the group that issues the local state of emergency that we're under. And this was articulated in um, Premier Kenny's comments last night, and we heard it again today, which is at best, phase two will open in June, uh, June 19th. And so we know that the success of subsequent phases is built on a success of the ones before it. And so I think what we can safely say is that uh, we'll be well into the summer before we get any kind of green light, but certainly I don't have a date and that will be provided to us by the province. And as we know that changes 
almost hourly uh, in terms of what they're seeing happening with spread and recovery rates. So I, I wish I had more clarity, but we certainly are planning to be ready to open um, as soon as we can and as safely as we can. And uh, I think it's important also to articulate that as much as those government timelines give us a frame, uh, we will make the executive decision on what we feel is the appropriate time to reopen. So even with that, there will be some decisions to be made by management on the board around what that looks like. All right, thank you. Here's another question um, that is, uh, once again, as soon as that sun came out, everybody started to think about camps. We certainly did. What is the likelihood that summer camps, uh, including ones like Kids in Motion, which is a very special camp we run, uh, will happen this summer? What can you tell us about where mm -hmm. we're at on that and what the timing might be for an announcement? Right, yeah, so we have been working very hard on this and um, this one obviously is very uh, soon to be in front of us and in the reopening plan, camps are actually allowed shortly after childcare is allowed to reopen. So this is uh, obviously a decision that we need to make very soon. Our goal is to actually put out an announcement tomorrow. And so we want to very um, carefully craft messages so that uh, we can reach all the people that uh, need to hear them. But we're certainly committed to making sure people know that as soon as tomorrow. And to peel back the curtain on that, that announcement that Shannon was talking about has been redrafted. I think we're on draft 11 because <laughs> things have changed that many times since we first started working on it. It is a very fluid environment, so it's, yeah. it's complicated. Um, Shannon, a, a question that came through the chat that um, there are many uh, YMCA staff that are on the call uh, and many that were unfortunately temporarily laid off. Um, you nodded to this in your earmarks, but what message do you have to those staff as we navigate this circumstance? What do you want them to know about how you're feeling about their situation? Yeah, well, the first thing I, I want everybody to know is there's not a, a moment of any day that goes by that I'm not thinking about them. Um, and I, I'm not kidding when um, when I say that was one of the hardest moments in my career was to make that call. Uh, I took this job because I care deeply about the people that are part of the organization, whether they be staff, volunteers, members, donors, partners, and that continues to be true, if not stronger today. And so, you know, I am working as hard as I can to make sure that I'm giving you all the information that I think you need. And we're committed to doing more uh, town halls as we had last week that give you an opportunity to engage and, and have real dialogue with us. And um, I know that we will come through this stronger and we're already seeing that in terms of our colleagues and um, we'll continue to be here for you. That employee assistance fund, we will continue to support as long as we need to. Uh, we've made a commitment on benefits for full time and we will continue to, to hold that um, under the premise that it's people first. And that principle has never been more true and, and I'm committed to honoring that all the way through. Great, thank you. There aren't any other questions right now in the queue, but um, let's give it a moment just to just to make sure that nobody else has one. We did have a nice comment from Laura Dana who says, thank you for all the hard work that you all do. She really appreciates it. So we appreciate it right back, Laura Dana. Uh, if anybody does have another question, maybe we'll pause for just a moment. And in that time, um, maybe I could just ask um, on behalf of people who might be interested, What's going on with our buildings? You saw some beautiful shots of some very big and fancy buildings, but um, obviously we didn't just shut them down and um, put the key away for a while. Give us a sense of what's happening to make sure those buildings stay ship shape. Yeah, well, I can tell you that the asset team, and if any of them are on the call tonight, thank you, thank you, thank you. They have been hard at work and, and you'll be able to see behind me that um, it's dark. It's dark in most of the buildings. And that's because uh, everybody has been working hard to safely demobilize those buildings. Um, the majority of our team are working from home and it is very rare that we would have uh, anybody in the buildings other than those taking good care of them. And so I can tell you that we're keeping a safe eye on them. I know that there's a, a lot of maintenance work going on right now actually and at Eau Claire today I, I know Tony and some of his um, staff were doing some work here. So this is actually a great opportunity very similar to what we're doing with our technology to do some planned maintenance work that will allow us to get the buildings in, in tip top shape uh, well while we're down. This is a very uh, an interesting question. Shannon, do we have to empty those huge swimming pools? 
No, we don't, Ken. Uh, that, that has been sort of the, the, the like burning question, other than what's happening this summer, what are we doing with the swimming pools? <laughs> Uh, well, what I what I can what I can tell you, and I'm certainly not the most um, educated person to be talking about this, but when we were first demobilizing, we actually did take out the ice in the arenas. Uh, we we knew that there likely would not be any more sports or anything happening on those, and so we did uh, take out the ice. We did not drain the swimming pools, but I know there is also potentially some some planned maintenance that we would normally do in the course of business throughout the year that that team wants to accelerate and actually potentially drain the pools, fix some tiles, do that kind of work so that when we get back up, we don't have another two week shutdown once we've just got running again. So they're doing all kinds of great strategic thinking about how to do that work right now. All right. Well, thank you very much, Shannon. Um, obviously, there's more information to come. Um, people can watch our channels, our social media, um, our website. Obviously, uh, there's no more questions in the in the Q and A uh, right now. So we'll we'll move to the next part of the agenda. But thank you very much for taking that on. It's always tough to be in the hot seat when the questions are coming at you, and we do appreciate your leadership there. Yeah, and now we're going to move on to a special presentation. It is my pleasure now to introduce Jenny Peterson. Jenny is a former team member of YMCA Calgary. She was the general manager who brought on the South Health Campus YMCA branch, which is a unique branch of its kind anywhere in the country, a YMCA embedded inside a hospital. She was also the project manager for YMCA Calgary's wellness program, so she knows the work that we do intimately. Then she decided to pursue her PhD at Brock University, and it just made sense that the person that we always knew as the queen of physical literacy chose the YMCA in which to anchor her research. Now I'd like to welcome Jenny to talk about what she's been up to in collaboration with the YMCA and um, she joins us virtually. Welcome Jenny. Thank you Ken and good evening everyone and also thank you to YMCA Calgary for inviting me to speak today. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and I was very thrilled to have the opportunity and it's been really fun to see familiar faces again. <laughs> uh, so as Ken mentioned, I'm doing my PhD and have been working together with the YMCA on my dissertation project for the past few years. And this project is focused on youth sport and physical activity participation. So tonight I'm going to share some of this work, including uh, some background, study design, that'll be really quick, <laughs> and of course some findings so far. Uh, but before I go further, I am going to briefly share my YMCA story. Next slide, please. And so, as Ken mentioned, I started my Y journey as a GM at South Health Campus YMCA back in 2012. And this was way back in the day when South Health Campus was still under construction, looking something like this in the picture. And um, after working in this role for a couple of years, I did move into a project management role supporting program development where I got to work on a number of cool, fun projects, such as starting a physical literacy strategy for summer day camps. In 2017, I made the very tough decision to go back to school to do my PhD at Brock University and moved across the country to Ontario. <laughs> and so as I was starting my program and thinking about what huge research project I would undertake uh, in my PhD, I remember having a catch up call with Bridget Edwards, who's the regional director for the North, and we were catching up and she was talking about, she was in the midst of preparing to open Shane Holmes YMCA. And I was telling her some ideas I had for my PhD research. And she was like, why don't you just do your PhD with us? And I was like, that's a good idea. <laughs> why not? <laughs> and so one thing led to another. And here I am working now in a different capacity today as a researcher with the YMCA. I'm currently in the third year of my, uh, my PhD program and hoping to finish this journey off within the next year. Next slide, please. So some background for you. In our society, we generally assume that sport is always a good thing and therefore always leads to positive development outcomes. You throw a ball in the field, kids gather around, and somehow they develop good character, leadership, teamwork skills, and more. And so while parts of that is true, <laughs> it's not always necessarily the case for all kids. And so this research is about critically examining this assumption, because if it were completely true, why do kids drop out of sports programs? So one of the things I've always remembered is the challenge we faced at the Y in getting youth to stay involved as they move from childhood into adolescence within their sports and physical activity programs. 
And so as I was starting to review the academic literature, I found numerous references to this same issue on a larger scale as well. And so the research problem we are trying to address is this decline that's happening in youth around age 11 to 14. Next slide, please. For this research, we're using an approach called action research. Uh, action research is a non-traditional approach to conducting a study that involves extensive partnerships between a researcher and a community. And the theory behind this approach is that getting multiple perspectives and lenses across different levels um, or stakeholders and different perspectives allows for a more cohesive view of a research problem. In this research project, over 20 YMCA staff from all levels across different departments, including sports and youth engagement to senior management have been involved in addition to over 40 youth. So with action researcher, sorry, with action research, everybody is a researcher in this project and through action and reflection together, we can create change. And as much as I feel like I, I'm pretty sure the one, um, the one presenting here today, I want to point out that this has been a huge collaborative effort. So um, I feel like I, I, I want to make sure I mention that. And there's a lot of people that I really do appreciate their time and energy that they've been putting into this project. So next slide, please. So as I mentioned in the earlier slide, this project has involved over 60 YMCA stakeholders, including management, coaches, and youth. Data for uh, so far has been collected across two YMCA branches um, at both Shane Holmes YMCA and Saddletown YMCA. So in phase one of this project, which took place in summer of 2018, we interviewed 10 youth and eight coaches involved with sport camps, basketball, and multi-sport programs. Phase one was focused on getting a general sense of youth experiences in sport and physical activity programs. In phase two, uh, which took place recently in fall of 2019, we conducted four focus groups, two at Shane Holmes and two at Saddletown YMCA. Youth who participated were involved with leadership programming, swimming sports programs, um, and, and many other aspects of the YMCA. Um, and this, so this phase was focused more on drawing up specific ideas and recommendations that youth would uh, have for supporting increased participation in sport and physical activity. So, um, and so we're now in uh, the phase three side of things. And so we're working on the design right now. And phase three is intended to impl implement the learnings from the earlier phases. And so we were preparing to implement a, a co-created program that would be designed by youth and coaches with myself for fall of 2020. However, with the COVID-19 situation, we've had to shift our plans. <laughs> and so we're now planning to design and validate a youth informed uh, instructors training that would be co-created with YMCA staff and myself instead. Next slide, please. Okay, so now onto the interesting part. What have we learned? What have you been telling us uh, so far? So for this presentation, I have pulled up some of the key findings and learnings, but I won't have time to present them all or in great detail. So this slide here presents uh, some of the results from phase one. So from development of new skills that helped youth build confidence to meeting new friends, it was certainly clear that there's a lot of positive impacts happening in programming. Um, I remember in one interview I did with an 11 year old boy in the basketball program, he highlighted how the program had made him think differently about life and how you had to really hard, work hard to reach your goals. And so, and it doesn't just come easy. So you can see there's something really important there happening for him. Another participant in the same program, I remember commented on the teamwork skills he had learned. And so you can see in the quote on the screen that you, he was, um, he's highlighted that you really need to depend on your teammates and you can't just depend on yourself for everything. So I think these are just representative of a number of impacts that um, I was certainly hearing from you. Next slide, please. So in phase two, we were able to gain deeper insight on what contrib contributes to disengagement amongst youth, um, in particular in 12 to 15 years of age. One of the themes that was identified includes that participation or access for all doesn't necessarily mean a sense of inclusion or belonging um, exists for all. They're separate concepts. And so, for example, as highlighted in the quote gathered from um, a participant in one of the focus groups, when you have a gym full of both junior high and high school ages, sometimes the high school ones will take over, making it hard for the junior high students to want to stay engaged. So a very different perspective that, um, you know, through the eyes of youth kind of gives you a different view of, of, of their experience. 
A second theme that was identified initially actually in phase one and then came up again in phase two was the idea that there are gendered sport experiences happening in programs. Girls and boys are experiencing sport and physical activity differently within the same program. And across interviews I did with the girls, I remembered, um, I observed that they often felt like they weren't as included at some times. And there was this, there's also this connection to a lack of perceived competence in their abilities related to that. So this quote in this slide um, was shared by a 12 year old girl in a sport camp program. And she highlights that before the rule happened, we the girls just felt like little wandering ghosts having nothing to do. She highlights this, this experience as well as, uh, sorry, this experience I think highlights um, as well as sheds lights on the challenges with creating inclusive experiences for everyone in a program. That's a very tough job uh, an instructor um, has to think about. Uh, it's very challenging. Um, and in my interviews and observations of programs in phase one, I kept noticing this reference to this rule called you must pass the girl rule before you can shoot. And that was being implemented in some programs um, at times just to help encourage more participation from the girls. However, in deeper reflection and discussion at times, we questioned this rule and whether it would really create a sense of belonging. And so to help address this, one of the actions YMCA staff took through the sport group, the sport teams, um, our department, uh, was the development of girls only program, which I believed uh, has launched um, uh, launched last fall. So, the next slide, please. And so what supports youth engagement? So moving on to themes that were identified around supporting youth engagement, a theme focused on using games based approaches had uh, was identified in phase two. Uh, so in phase two, uh, during the focus groups, uh, we had led some different activities and asked youth what they preferred. So in comparison to activities um, that focus more on skill development, so your more traditional skills and drills, a majority of youth highlighted how they found uh, when there is an integration of more games, challenges, or, more, or mini game formats, they found the game based approaches more fun and more engaging. And then within another theme, uh, creating youth inclusive spaces. A sub theme was identified that when youth are in a group with others around the same age, specifically within two to three years, they are more comfortable participating or trying new things. So I think that really uh, that's a really important aspect, uh, maybe potentially around programming to, to we could uh, we, we are trying to consider. All right, next slide. So this final slide on on learnings um, goes, I think, beyond the direct delivery of programming and more speaks to an approach to programming overall. So throughout the focus groups, we asked youth whether having their input in this research and in the design of programs might be important, and if so, why? Unanimously, they all agreed it was critical to have the opportunity to have their voices heard as it gives us the ability to change the future. Further to this, they highlighted that if the research and program design was completely done by adults, the results might be different. I did ask, uh, after I asked this question in the focus groups, um, I also asked whether adult involvement would still be important, and they all absolutely agree that yes, adult involvement is important, noting that adults would likely know much more information about budget and cost of programs, and they thought that was very important, <laughs> of course. <laughs> and so, so the wording in this theme, co-create programs with youth and not just for them, is intentional. And you might have noticed it in the title slide as well. It tries to capture the importance of involving your the youth community in program planning and design as a way to help support their engagement. And I think it's become a, a really key learning we're taking away as we move into phase three and even beyond. Even today in a discussion I was involved with on a phone call as you're designing phase three and, and talking to several YMCA staff on that call, um, it's appearing to be a, a broader, uh, an importance of on a broader scale in, to regard, uh, in regard to how the YMCA uh, is supporting uh, successful youth engagement in general, and so beyond just sport and physical activity programs. Next slide, please. So in connection with this earlier slide, in the last focus group session with youth, we asked them to share what they learned, and many highlighted how the process, process of, of coming together with others around the same age had been very empowering as it was comforting to know that other youth had many of the same challenges and, and feelings as they did while participating in sport and activity. And so this concept supporting youth empowerment, so through, through co-creation 
of programming is highlighted by this picture on the slide, which was done by one of the girls in the focus groups, where she highlights that she learned that research is important along with getting people's opinions and that youth play a big role in the YMCA and that their opinions matter. And that's where I'm going to end off. Thank you so much for listening and inviting me here to speak today. Thank you Matt, very much, Jenny. That is terrific. As you can see, uh, ladies and gentlemen that are watching, uh, the work still happens. Uh, she had a meeting today talking to our staff and creating uh, wonderful experiences and reimagining experiences for our teams. My favorite part, there's two favorite parts of Jenny's research for me. One was the fact that um, that young man that she quoted said, you know, it's really, you need to depend on your teammates. And boy, in this moment, we're learning that. My second best part, and this is maybe bad news for the staff that are listening, you still have to do the budgets because you're the adult. So ha ha, <laughs> they get to have all the fun. Thank you, Jenny. That's terrific. We uh, really appreciate you taking time uh, to tell us about your wonderful collaboration with the YMCA and the young people we serve. And we are all very much looking forward to calling you Dr. Jenny soon enough. Okay, before I do a few short thank yous, uh, one final word about the YMCA at this moment. Uh, you've heard a lot about what's going on right now. And of course, though our, those our facilities are closed. But we are not closed for business, as Jenny has just shown us. For 118 years, YMCA Calgary has supported the health of our community, and the COVID-19 pandemic is no different. We're working hard to use our resources and expertise to support the community right now. One key focus being how we can safely offer summer programming to children, youth, and families. Yes, we'll have more information about that tomorrow, but to help us in doing that, we are also seeking donations right now to support these new programs and our general operating costs. And uh, YMCA community, we need your help. If you're available and able, please support your YMCA with a donation. Every donation, big or small, will make a difference to ensure we return strong and ready to serve you. And I have really great news. Your donation is going to go further because of the generosity of the Sargent family, their members and donors who have agreed to match up to $50,000 raised for summer programming. So thank you, Sargent family, for your amazing generous support at this moment. If you'd like to support us figuring out what YMCA summer programming is gonna look like, please visit our website to donate and pass it on to other $50,000 available to match. All right, so there it is. We are now bringing to close our first ever virtual AGM. I gotta tell you, putting this together was like launching the space shuttle. I'd like to thank my YMCA teammates, Tryon Angel, uh, Richard Hanna, Haley Banyard, who have been doing amazing work behind the scenes and tonight to make that happen. We had great help from a firm called WBM for their technical expertise. Uh, James, thank you for being our silent partner here tonight. A huge thanks again to Ross Bentley and Jeff Bacher from the law firm Blakes for their great advice on navigating the governance of our AGM in a virtual environment. Most appreciated gentlemen, I think we might have kept our charitable status. Good job. Thank you to our board and staff leadership for their hard work in delivering this necessary event for our charity. You were so flexible and understanding and you hit every note. That's it. My name is Ken Lee McCuelo. Be safe and be well. And as we like to say here at the YMCA, have a great YMCA day. Thank you very much and we'll see you all soon.